and particularly our speaker, you know, made time for us. So um, welcome to the lecture series for Center for Chinese Study at UCLA. Um, our uh, director, Professor Michael Berry, today have to um, chair and participate in another event. So um, the, uh, um, you know, um, the, uh, to my regret that he cannot be here, but you know, I am just playing double duty and on behalf of him to welcome everybody. And just a reminder that the uh, um, Center for Chinese Study at UCLA have a whole series of program, very, very rich. So um, um, please continue you know, um, to uh, join us uh, for all the events. So uh, today um, the, we have the um, fortune to have uh, Dr. Wang uh, from Hong Kong uh, to join us. Um, so before uh, we, uh, I turn the podium to him, uh, allow me uh, to introduce uh, Dr. Wang uh, a little bit. Um, actually, uh, I learned about his exhibition during the correspondence with my advisee, who was uh, her colleague teacher at the uh, Chinese U uh, of Hong Kong. So when I learned about it, I got all excited. And then she was very gracious, you know, uh, agree uh, to give a talk. And uh, so I also organized an undergraduate seminar around this topic, debating globalization. So I think it's just uh, all, you know, chance encounter and <laughs> interest brought us together. Uh, Dr. Wang Guanyu now is the associate uh, curator um, uh, of the Art Museum at Chinese University of Hong Kong. And uh, um, she received her degree also from uh, Chinese University of Hong Kong. Um, and after she got very solid training in uh, um, field archaeology and ceramic archaeology uh, from Beijing University. And her previous advisor actually we were just chatting, you know, uh, Professor Qin Da Su. It's really the authority um, in um, ceramic in all regard, not just all the uh, kiln site in China, but also with the recent, you know, rising topic about this uh, global trade. Um, so um, the Dr. Wang is very young, but uh, you know, I read. I was read um, when I read her um, uh, CV, and she has a lot of experiences. She has participated in the excavation of the Qin Muslim site and also Ding uh, Kiln uh, uh, site. And uh, from uh, 2009, uh, she is uh, you know a, a main a key um, participant in this uh, uh, J.C. Lee Memorial Fellowship, I think at, uh, um, at the City University, right? Uh, on the subject of the uh, study of the um, uh, East and West. So it's, uh, um, it's um, I think this program um, title, uh, Ming Prince and Poset, the Poset Production and Consumption of Princely Household in the Ming Dynasty. And, um, then, then since you know she has curated two uh, major uh, show, uh, one is the uh, twenty eighteen. Um, it's based on the um, the Jingdezhen Imperial Portion, um, the uh, production site, um, and the uh, show title, the newly discovered Imperial Portion from uh, Zhengtong, uh, Jingtai, and Tianshun uh, reign of the Ming Dynasty. And then um, last uh, year, 2021, uh, she opened another show in September and the show I think just ended. Uh, the show um, titled um, Enchanting Expeditions, Chinese Tree Porcelain Across the Globe. It came out with a, a um, catalog, even, you know, I haven't received it, but I, you know, got the, um, the privilege that she shared uh, and also, um, um, related, um, you know, her article uh, published in orientation and the, um, she also had given many um, the talk on the subject. So um, the production, trade and consumption of Chinese porcelain during the Ming and Qing is one of Dr. Wang's main focus. And another main focus would be on the intersection and uh, exchange of the material civilization be between the East and West um, in the early uh, globalization. So uh, I think the um, being it in uh, Chinese U and the Art Museum, we know the, uh, the museum have a stellar collection of uh, um, the uh, trade whale, right? Over a thousand pieces. 
And it's just so many generation of the effort of collectors and also you know, her presidents and many uh, scholars. And now she's a, a rising uh, a young star <laughs> in this uh, you know, a rising field of a global study. So I think it's something really exciting. So today um, she is going to talk about um, the Chinese tree porcelains international commodity in the early phase of globalization. And um, so I think uh, um, I want to invite everybody that's joined the speaker to travel back in time and across the globe to see you know, how Ming and Qing Postman came to dominate the international um, the market. And also, I think now, you know, this is uh, oh, everybody interested in how the uh, Swedish trade, you know, the Chinese uh, uh, ceramic Chinese person entered the daily life and the visual culture of the world. Okay, so without further ado, uh, please join me and let's uh, all welcome uh, Dr. Wang Guanyu. Thank you, Professor Li. And thanks so much for in, uh, introducing me and inviting me to this um, like uh, giving me an opportunity to share my recent recent research and exhibitions to all of you. And uh, hi, everyone. Um, welcome to join this talk. Uh, maybe I start from now and uh, I'm sharing my PowerPoint. Mm -hmm. Everyone can see my screen, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. OK, so as mentioned by Professor Lee, um, this today I will invite you to join me in a time travel like back to 500 years ago and to see how Chinese ceramics uh, came to charm the world. Um, so uh, before start, uh, please allow me to use a few minutes to uh, like introduce my museum and uh, like our galleries and the exhibition behind this story. So. Uh, firstly, um, I'm now working for the Art Museum of the Chinese University of Hong Kong, which is in a university museum. And uh, as shown here, we have two buildings and we founded in the year of 1971. Uh, and we now have uh, four galleries and uh, our collection is, uh, uh, we have over, uh, uh, over 15,000 um, uh, item, items um, of our collection. So, uh, our four galleries uh, are located um, on three floors uh, of our buildings, and uh, uh, they are Gallery 1 for mainly painting and calligraphy, Gallery four, uh, 2 for antiquities, and Gallery 3 and 4, uh, which is more multifunctional. And the exhibition um, mentioned by Professor Lee, which is um, curated by me, uh, named as Enchanting Expeditions, Chinese Trade Porcelains Across the Globe, is now on display um, in Gallery 3 and 4. Um, as shown here in the pictures, you will see uh, after a renovation of the showcases of these two galleries, which is um, supported by the financial uh, support um, of the Beishan Tang Foundation now, it looks uh, very new and amazing. and. Uh, it's multi-functional for like uh, antiquities and also for displaying paintings and uh, calligraphies because the showcases have a very prices control of temperature and the humidity. Um, so uh, this is the poster of the exhibition. And um, today we will have an overview uh, of the Sino-European maritime trade in porcelain during the Ming and the Qing dynasties based on the selected exhibits from this exhibition. And they are mainly uh, trade porcelains and related objects from the art museum and other public and uh, private collections. Um, at the head of the age of discovery, uh, Europeans flocked to the Orient, uh, plunging the main empire into a globalization uh, matrix uh, the great variety of produced and finely crafted objects from Ming China quickly became sought after international com commodities uh, in a growing world market. So among the most highly priced Chinese goods were silk, porcelains, liquorware, and tea. Uh, translucent and shiny, light and durable to um, wear and uh, erasure. The exotic porcelain with the uh, mysterious oriental style 
took the Europeans um, by storm as soon as it arrived to the continent. So merchants from everywhere tried to um, actively involved in the design, manufacture, shipment, and sale of Chinese porcelain. So this has resulted um, the diversification and uh, of the production centers, as well as an amazing array of um, types and decorations for this vibrant China ware. So the Chinese trade porcelain that entered its golden age and caused marvelous ebb and flow in the globalized commercial world. Uh, and this story is organized in six sections, uh, encountering, uh, encountering, altering uh, oriental wonders, thriving country of China, manufacture and the transport of porcelain, braving ocean waves, international fashions, and the profound impact of China wares. So um, by these six different sections, um, we aim to reconstruct the design, manufacture, transport, and sale processes of Chinese export, export porcelain, and their use and impact in overseas markets, as well as how it profoundly impacted the porcelain industry of the world. So hope, hope I can keep everything in time. <laughs> it's a long story. So we move to the first section. Actually, um, before the East and West was um, connected directly through the ocean routes, um, the interactions and the exchanges are quite limited, mainly through the Mediterranean area showing us here. But at the time, actually, there was already a mature trade network around the international, uh, around the India Ocean, and uh, there's a, pro, a prosperous overseas market for the Chinese porcelain already. And uh, during the discovery, uh, during the age of discovery, there are many um, brave captains and sailors who explored oceans with their lives at risk. Here are some early leading characters shown here who are really paid, um, re really contributed a lot uh, to the uh, connection between the East and the West. And uh, um, based on their contributions, actually, as shown here, different parts of the globe were linked together by ocean routes for the first time. And uh, among the early sponsors of discovered uh, activities, the Portuguese King Manuel I is very famous for his passion for China. As showing here his order to the officials for the Far East, he's asked everything about China uh, and the, the main people there. So it, is, it was also during his reign that the Portuguese first arrived in China as the earliest in Europeans and in the year of 1513. As shown here in the galleries, um, actually um, uh, Portuguese first introduction to China's porcelain was through the Jingdezhen wares, like the blue, uh, blue and white wares here. They are already uh, prevalent across Asia. This product soon became an important medium to demonstrate status and wealth by the royals and, and the aristocrats of Portugal and the other European nations. As shown here, despite this bowl, uh, the porcelain wares are showing a very strong Islamic taste by the geographic style and uh, densely decorated floral patterns. They were also one of the earliest porcelain that were presented in the European paintings which was believed to be imported to uh, Venice through the Mediterranean network. We can see that in the painting of the Feast of the Gods, uh, there are three blue and white porcelain being reproduced re uh, in, this, uh, in this painting. And uh, right here, this bowl with fruits, it looks very similar as our exhibits. And this was um, 
being like uh, transported or uh, shipped um, like most probably through the Mediterranean area. And also at this time, um, the cargoes from shipwrecks also provide us with an overview of the Chinese porcelain trade during this period. Uh, like uh, the one we choose here for the exhibition is the Learner Show Junk, uh, sank around 1500, uh, where it's near the coast of the Philippines. And uh, here are some uh, similar examples as the discoveries of the shipwrecks. And they are also showing a very strong Islamic taste uh, in terms of shapes and design. Uh, like this one, the covered box here, Actually, it was have a uh, metalwork prototypes from the brass box uh, made in Syria in 15th century. And actually, um, direct trade or we call it uh, transportation of Chinese porcelain by the Portuguese are also provided by existed pieces in Portugal, which is uh, another like uh, Roots that Chinese uh, blue and white can enter Europe in the uh, early age. And um, for example, um, we could see there's a similar piece uh, in the collection of the Santos Palace. And the Santos Palace is very famous because it was being used since the uh, time of the King Manuel I, the, 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 the king who are very uh, like uh, full of passion for China. And so um, it was believed that the, the, uh, the early pieces in this collection is belonged to the King Manuel I and um, could be transported by the Portuguese when they arrived in Asia or um, when they arrived in uh, China. So this, this is um, an example. And the, you, you see the dishes in the, uh, they are being hung in the ceiling. There's a pyramidal, uh, shape of ceiling uh, in the China room of the Santos Palace, which is um, being decorated, I think, uh, in the renovation project in uh, 18th century uh, by the Lancaster family who have uh, lived there during the time. And so they have been uh, put all these dishes from uh, uh, the royal collections and their own collections up to the ceiling. And, and also um, I have just uh, mentioned also this piece um, when we just have a short chat before, the, uh, before this talk with Professor Lee. Uh, there's some uh, early pieces that were ordered or commissioned by the Portuguese. Um, like uh, back in the early 16th century, uh, no, mid 16th, uh, the Portuguese royalty, aristocrats, uh, religion organizations and merchants who are active at the uh, Far East uh, began to commission porcelain in Jingdao Zhen. Uh, this kind of made to order pieces were uh, are really rare uh, with less than 50 pieces were have to be uh, existed at, uh, at this time, at this moment. And the most noteworthy of the porcelain uh, one of the most uh, noteworthy porcelains is a group of Yuhu Chun vase or Yuhu Chun bottle sharing the same um, Portuguese inscriptions showing here. Uh, it reads like, Instrumento fazel Jorge Alves na ela de uh, un cinco cinco dois hin. Uh, that means uh, Jorge Alves had this made in the year of 20. Uh, in, in the year of 1552 of the reign of King John, III, uh, John III. So um, this bottle is made by George, uh, is ordered by George Elvish and, uh, George, uh, and the George, well, uh, George Elvish is a Portuguese um, dignitary, a merchant who was active in the East and a writer. Uh, he commissioned these bottles to present to the royal families and an um, nobility of the Middle East and Europe in order to consolidate his maritime trade network connections. And now there were only 10 pieces exist in the public and the private collection, collections around the world. 
um, I'm showing them here. Wow. You can see they are um, being praised, uh, like being a different uh, conditions. Some are broken, but were decorated or fixed with some uh, metal works. And uh, it, uh, it is also showing the, like the rarity of this kind of bottles. And, uh, and also the one from our collection, which is belongs to the private collection in Hong Kong. And on arrival in, in Asia, the Portuguese first used Malacca and the islands near the China coast um, to as bases to conduct anti-port trade with China and other uh, regions in Asia. Uh, and also fragments with the same inscriptions as these bottles were uh, discovered on the Shangchuan Island in Taishan in Guangdong, China. So this, uh, these pieces together with the large quantity of Chinese porcelain being discovered uh, at this island prove that this island was one of the key sites of early Sino-Portuguese interaction and the commissioning of Chinese trade porcelain which make this, uh, make this uh, evidence uh, really important for telling the story of the early times of the Sino-Portuguese trade. And uh, the, uh, the rarity of this bottle could also be um, proved by the Medici copy. Um, like uh, late 17th century, a ceramic workshop under the patronage of the Medici family has produced some soft paste ceramics based on imported Chinese porcelain prototypes. And uh, they gave this as gift to European royalty and uh, aristocrats. Among the 50 pieces um, uh, of Medici ceramics which are known to have survived, there's a bottle painted with um, deer, crane, and pine design in the collection of the Louvre Museum and uh, which was a gift to the French court from the Medici family. And by looking this piece carefully and compared to the, uh, the, the George Elvash bottle, we will see that um, there's so many details are matched. And uh, uh, we believe that um, this Medici copy maybe have um, uh, take the uh, this Yu Hu Chun bottle uh, as a as a prototype to uh, making his uh, to to as a prototype to as a produced um, uh, origin. So uh, make this um, also an evidence uh, that makes sure that um, this bottle is really rare and uh, of a very high value to the European um, to, to the Europeans at that time. And also this Yu Hu Chun bottle was actually uh, earlier belonged to also an Italian um, noble family. So make this, this uh, like uh, more uh, consolidated. And although um, this, uh, this kind of ordering pieces are quite limited in scale, uh, but uh, this kind of initiate direct Sino-European interactions across the globe on the manufacture and the consumption of porcelains uh, led to the age of globalization of Chinese porcelain. This is a very early start. And then we can move on to the second section, which is uh, in this section, we will see how the main China look like um, when the, uh, during the time when Europeans arrived and uh, the, the, the various um, kiln centers across China, which produced ceramics uh, of outstanding qu uh, quality to both the domestic and overseas markets. So um, prior to the uh, arrival of the Europeans, actually Ming China was seeing economic diversification and uh, specialization as a result of um, political stability, population growth, and the general improvements in living conditions. Uh, and the main working people were no longer bound to the land, so they can, um, uh, they can like, uh, be active uh, in any ec economic activities, 
with a relative freedom. So as a result, a variety of crafts flourished in the country. Um, showing here in the late main painting, which is showing the property of the uh, south capital of Ming, Nanjing. Um, we can see there's so many shops and the people and uh, a lot of uh, different cargoes from everywhere. And it's also showing a uh, very direct transportation um, among the, among the main, uh, in the main China and also uh, connected to the overseas. And also um, there's a, a right, sorry, I, can't, I cannot see. So there's a written by a Dominican uh, Fria, uh, a Portuguese Dominican Fria, who are writing down uh, his um, uh, writing down his feelings after he visited Guangzhou in 1556. Uh, uh, I cannot read it because the the window has um like uh, it's it's behind the window. Uh, but in his scene, he was like uh, surprised by the proper uh, property. Uh, prosperity of the Guangzhou. So um, this both um, prove that the late Ming China is already you know, great prosperous and uh, get ready for uh, like bigger global markets. And this is um, the theme to the porcelain industry. Uh, the porcelain farming was flourishing in various kiln centers across China from the middle Ming onwards. The arrival of merchants from countries like uh, Portugal, uh, Spain, and the Netherlands, and the opening of uh, various trading routes between China and Europe led to new demand from the international market. So this all driving the, world, the worldwide seal of Chinese porcelain um, and the most outstanding centers for ceramic production and export included Jingdozhen in Jiangxi, Yixing in Jiangsu, as well as Zhangzhou and Dehua in Fujian. So we'll go through a little bit this kind of um, their representative products. Uh, here are some Jingdozhen blue and white wares. Actually, Jingdozhen is um, already um, famous for his, his uh, like outstanding quality uh, imperial pieces produced and only being used to the court, the Ming court. Uh, but uh, uh, like uh, during the Jiajing period, uh, actually there's some change uh, between the, uh, there's some change on the production and uh, like um, uh, management of Jingdezhen kilns that um, the, due to the imperial kilns um, limited capacity, the government seconded capable private kilns to help fire official porcelain from uh, uh, the official porcelain. And this break, breaks the boundary and distinction between the imperial and private kilns. The design, raw materials and manufacturing techniques previously monopolized by the imperial kilns now spread to the private sector. So this make the uh, the Jingdezhen's uh, production reached a peak and uh, porcelain for civilian use became increasingly ex exquisite and luxurious and entered its heyday of production. So at this background, when the Europeans are um, arrived, Jingdezhen had supplied this new market with fine porcelain that featured high quality, innovative design and shapes, and they were equal in quality, uh, in quality to imperial wares for the main court. And also uh, porcelain with over glazed uh, enamel decorations are also being produced and became popular in the domestic and overseas markets. Uh, this kind of porcelain with a rich, vibrant palette and uh, fine gilding decorations sometimes um, began to make its mark in the other uh, Asian regions in of Japan, Southeast Asia, and Central Asia. And uh, later on, this kind of um, porcelains were appreciated and valued by the European customers also. And uh, here, maybe I talk about a little bit about the difference um, between the blue and the white and this enameled pieces. 
uh, because the enameled pieces we call the overglazed decorations, um, actually they were being done after the porcelain were fired for the first time and the decoration will be uh, applied on the surface of the glaze. And after that, the porcelain will be fired for a second time or third time to fix these enamels in a lower temperature, which is around um, 600 to 800. So it's a little bit different for, from the blue and white porcelains, which were fired uh, for only one time. Uh, the cobalt blue was applied uh, when the when the porcelain was uh, shaped, um, uh, they will apply it on the surface and then be covered by the glaze. So this is some different um, differences of the techniques be between these two products. And it is also made um, the uh, overglazed uh, decorated pieces more rare because it's very easy to, uh, to like uh, have some uh, failure between different uh, processes. And it's not easy to get one perfect piece after so many uh, processes. And uh, also uh, the Jingdu Zhen kilns have produced a specific um, kind of uh, blue and white porcelain, um, which I think many of you have recognized that they are the, we called the crack style. And the crack has named after um, uh, some, like the majority of the uh, scholars believe that um, this crack named after the crack ship, uh, which is a, a kind of sh a Portuguese um, ship during the time. And they are shipping like uh, Chinese blue and porcelain in this kind of style, uh, which is uh, have paneled decorations um, like the dish here and the bowls. And also um, we sometimes they have the medallion shape or like the flower shaped, uh, like a window showing the Chinese view. So this kind of decoration is quite um, like uh, popular at the time when this kind of crack shapes were captured by the Dutch and uh, a lot of Chinese porcelains were bring to the, um, Amsterdam and uh, uh, been sold by auctions there. So uh, this kind of style got its name after the shape as the crack wares. And um, this kind of uh, special types were also believed to be the earliest uh, Chinese porcelains that were designed and produced for the new market of Europe. So um, it is also of a very good quality. And uh, at the uh, and here is a painting that are showing the popularity of this kind of uh, styles. Uh, in this painting of uh, 1636, we can, we can see that the painters just uh, combined a lot of different crack uh, pieces like the, a big dish, the small saucer, and also the, the, the candy uh, in shape of elephant with a small window decoration here. So um, we can see that they were really popular during the, uh, the time and uh, especially for the Dutch, fa uh, Dutch markets. And also uh, due to the constantly uh, increasing market demand and the great um, profit behind uh, the export porcelain industry along the coast of Fujian and Guangdong rose and developed dramatically. And showing here some uh, representatives are the Zhangzhou wares and uh, uh, Dohua wares. Uh, actually different from Jingdou Zhen, the Zhangzhou kilns manufactured porcelain especially for overseas markets. So there's uh, hardly find any uh, pieces existed in the domestic markets besides the discoveries in the Zhangzhou kiln sites. And their primary products included blue and white porcelain, enameled pieces, and the su san cai, the plain three uh, enamel, uh, the princely, plain three colors with no red enamel. So this uh, mainly this three kind, uh, this um, three kind of uh, uh, porcelain was. And um, maybe you have noticed that um, they have also produce this crack uh, style uh, porcelain uh, for the overseas market. But if we check its uh, 
uh, more closely. Actually, the Zhangzhou was showing a lower quality, but they are selling at the time with a lower price. So this makes um, the Zhangzhou West produces um, the products mainly for the Asian markets and uh, became popular uh, primarily in Japan, Southeast Asia and the Central Asia. And, and also uh, like according to the VOC records, the Dutch India family records, uh, Chinese posting at the time um, were divided into uh, fine pieces and coarse pieces, which is a uh, perfect perfectly matched with um, the Zhangzhou wares and the Jingdezhen wares where we see now. Um, and also this shows that the Jingdezhen and Zhangzhou wares did not overlap as far as the destination and the pricing were concerned. Uh, this avoid peers competition be, 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 uh, between the two. So the, the, the Jingdezhen wares are mainly transported by the long distance, uh, going back to the European markets and the Zhangzhou West, just filling the needs of the Asian market. And also the Dehua West, which are famous for its uh, pro, uh, monochrome milky white glaze, which also got a beautiful name in the overseas market as the Blanche de Chine. And um, there are, here are showing some uh, primary um, uh, types of uh, the Huawei's. Also, they have enameled pieces and also the Guan Yin uh, statue uh, and also the lines here. And um, the like shirts from this kind of the Huawei's were found widely uh, at the land sites in Europe and also among the cargoes um, of shipwrecks. And also the Yixing Sha, which is famous actually firstly among the Chinese literati in the Jiangnan area, uh, the South China part. Uh, and later it, were, it was being uh, uh, traded to the overseas markets uh, at the very end of the Ming. And this is because the, like the tea drinking uh, habits and the tea leaves were exported at the time and became popular in the overseas markets. So uh, Yixing Zisha West uh, gradually became like uh, converted objects in Asia and were cherished by the Europeans from the 17th century onwards. And we can see the, there are like little uh, teapots, which is um, suitable for Kung Fu Cha, like the Kung Fu tea, less, which is popular in the um, Southeast coast along the Southeast coast of China. And also this is the a very big bolt, which is uh, for boiling water. And after uh, we know all this kind of uh, different uh, porcelain products um, during the time, and we can move on to see um, how this porcelain were produced and being transported in China and how they arrived at ports along the, um, the, the, east, uh, the, the, the southeast coast and get ready for the global voyage. <clears throat> and um, by telling this story, uh, actually we are using the, to tell this story, we are actually using the export paintings uh, made in Guangdong. Uh, actually uh, back into the time when the Chinese porcelain had a special allure across um, Europe, the customers there were deeply fascinated with this new materials, never, uh, seen before and um, were very curious about more details about it. But, uh, but like uh, the, the raw materials, the formula, the production procedures, uh, many details were keep and uh, were stay, uh, remaining like a secret uh, for a long period of time. So at this background, export paintings made in Guangzhou from the early 18th century uh, started to illustrate the manufacture, transport, and seal of the export porcelain. And this became like uh, uh, dramatically popular among the European customers. And uh, uh, exist, existent export paintings uh, feature up to 50 images uh, illustrating a series of scenes. 
And uh, here we have borrowed uh, 10 of them from the collection of the Hong Kong Maritime Museum, which has, uh, they have uh, 32 pieces um, in this collection. And uh, such paintings actually provided Europeans with uh, valuable insights into the multiple as aspects of the Chinese porcelain. And also for us today, this is uh, very good for us to know more details about uh, the secret of China. So uh, I will like go through this uh, 10 paintings. Uh, the first one is called Raozhou Prefe uh, Prefecture. Um, and Raozhou actually administrates on the, Fu, uh, the Fuliang County and the Jingdezhen, the porcelain town of Jingdezhen. So all this um, like uh, of porcelain um, for use at the royal court, the royal court uh, for the domestic market and overseas market are all being sent to Jingdezhen via the like um, through here and the merchants and officials, uh, everyone uh, can like uh, uh, concentrate at here and uh, to make their businesses or um, to uh, like send their orders. And the second part is um, the one of the producing process um, of the Chinese porcelains, which is called glazing the porcelain. As I mentioned uh, earlier, uh, a little bit earlier, um, this, this is a very important part to covering the porcelain with a protection layer. Uh, and this showing in the paintings, we can see that the workers just uh, dip the balls and uh, Chinese pieces into the, the, the barrel. The barrel is full of the lime glaze, which is looks, looks like a white slurry. And after a high temperature firing, it will become a translucent, a, a transparent glassy glaze to protect uh, the surface of the porcelain. And uh, the cobalt blue, which is later the blue and white porcelain, uh, that was decorated before glazing, um, the, before the glazing uh, process. So that is that will be covered by the glaze and called the underglaze decoration. And uh, after, uh, after the porcelain were um, down, they will be uh, loaded into the kilns to firing for three days and nights. And uh, after the temperature is uh, cooling down, uh, the potters, the walkers will remove the porcelain from the kilns. We can see that um, they're still hot inside the kilns. So the, the walkers just wrap his uh, waist and uh, body with the wet towels to keep uh, cool. And uh, they are removing the suckers which contains the porcelain inside um, out, out. And uh, there's workers taking the porcelain out and put them into the barrels to, uh, for transport. And later after everything is done and uh, we can see also there are some pieces being uh, decorated for the second time of like the overglazed enamel. And um, they are packing the products in barrels and this is for a long distance travel. And um, the interesting part of the, um, the, the collection of the Hong Kong Maritime Museum is that uh, they have two images showing how the Chinese porcelain were uh, transported um, by the waterways and uh, how to uh, pass the mountain. So this is a little bit rare and different from the other, se uh, other series of ex export paintings showing the manufacture and the transportation of um, Chinese porcelains. So um, one picture is showing that uh, uh, the, 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 the porcelain laden ship is shooting the rapids. And we can see this is a very uh, anxious scene that a storm is raging and the boatman is uh, very nervous because they are afraid the ship will like, the boat will uh, hit the, the, like, uh, the rocks. So even the merchant and uh, his servant inside uh, on board that uh, looks uh, really anxious 
about this kind of uh, situation. And this is also shows the risks they have um, during the transportation by the waterways. And uh, another one is the, called the surmounting the mountain pass. And uh, actually the, the Chinese bowling wells were not transported all the way by the water, um, by, by rivers. Actually, there's a very big mountain called Da Yu Mountain between the Jiangxi and Guangdong province. And also maybe some of you know that uh, Guangdong is also called the South of the Mountain, Lingnan. That because of um, this, this Da Yu Mountain, the, 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 the mountain Ling is, uh, refers to Da Yu. So um, after they get the south um, point of Jiangxi, um, they have to transport the Chinese porcelain across uh, trans transport all the Chinese porcelain to uh, like over across the mountain. And uh, here um, we can see um, there's a lot of uh, potters like carrying the porcelains uh, and reach the Nanxiong in Guangdong. So from there, they will be again be uh, reloaded into boats and they can ship along the Pearl River system uh, until they arrive at Guangzhou. And this is um, quite interesting uh, part of the secrets of how, China, how Chinese porcelain were transported uh, in China. So after the Chinese porcelain arrived in Guangzhou, there are still a lot of things to do. Like the Westerners, uh, the Westerners can uh, here to roll up from Wanpoa to Guangzhou to collect their cargo. Um, actually, uh, during the Ming and Qing dynasties, foreign merchants were not permitted to go to porcelain production centers such as in Dojin, and they are also not allowed to, uh, to direct trade in the Guangzhou city. And uh, so they have to make the orders through the Hong merchants, Hong, Hong Shang, um, to um, make the orders and can only collect their cargoes uh, at outside the city. And um, um, another image is showing actually the process of how to um, paint the overglazed enamels on the surface. But this one is uh, made in Guangzhou. So uh, this is the Guangzhou um, painters who are doing this kind of, of work and a little bit different from the pieces made in Jindouzhen. These ones are called the Guangcai, the Canton enameled ware. And Guangcai is, became popular because here in Guangzhou, the foreign customers can have a very um, direct connection with the painting, uh, with the painters, and they can order the, um, like some special um, decorations uh, directly and make, uh, revisions and correct the decoration once they can see it in Guangzhou. So this makes everything more direct. And uh, this is why um, the Guangcai pieces became popular. Uh, and this will uh, like um, save a lot of uh, cost for the foreign uh, customers also. After it was painted, um, actually, uh, as I mentioned earlier, the enameled pieces will be uh, fired for the second or third time. But here we can see they are using a more um, uh, like easier stove, which is um, built by the brakes. And uh, also because the temperature requirement is lower, uh, around six to six, uh, six to 800 degrees. So it's more easier and uh, uh, smaller size of the stove to be built which may make, make it possible to, um, uh, to do the overglaze decorations in Guangzhou, but cannot uh, fire in the real porcelain in Guangzhou because the dragon kiln and, or the mantou yao, the, 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 the kilns in the bun shape in the Jindouzhen is really difficult to be built here in Guangzhou. And um, the final image is showing that the European merchants at the porcelain sh uh, shop and this is real, uh, also uh, very uh, full of fun that we can see uh, in the porcelain shop. Uh, there's a lot of uh, different kind of uh, Chinese porcelains uh, of various colors on display. And the merchants 
uh, with the two attendants are each holding a large sack which we can like thermos uh, might be filled with silver coins to pay um, for the orders and uh, they will track the pieces in the shops and uh, uh, to like comm commissioned several different um, types and make the order here and after the order was confirmed uh, actually the order will be sent all the way back to Raojo Prefri again and uh, there's another loop like how the Chinese was uh, Chinese porcelains were uh, produced and transported and finally they can get the cargo here and so uh, from here like uh, everyone is getting ready for the global travel of the Chinese porcelain this is why we're going to the uh, fourth section finally actually after like a very long time uh, we finally get ready for the global voyage of the Chinese porcelain and um, uh, here's a uh, navigation route during the uh, 16th to 19th centuries showing the very busy network and the part as showing here the Portuguese trades are uh, the Portuguese shapes um, and those of the Dutch and the, the uh, British um, India companies could pass uh, past the Strait of Malacca, uh, enter the India Ocean, and then sail along the coast of the Africa, uh, past the uh, past the Cape of Good Hope to reach Europe. And um, on the other side of the globe, the Spanish trading ships will uh, based in the Philippines, uh, they will just uh, regularly uh, traverse the Pacific Ocean to reach Drake space on the west coast of North America, and then sail southward to Acapulco in Mexico. And from there, the Chinese goods could be um, transported uh, overland to the west coast of the Atlantic Ocean and then being shipped to their final destination in Europe. So um, this is a very busy uh, travel network and bringing the Chinese porcelain wares everywhere. Um, but during this time, actually, um, the global long distance uh, trade is uh, a long distance ship uh, long distance sailing is full of risks. Um, as shown here in a map, we have uh, picked up uh, 51 shipwrecks along the travel routes. Um, this is only like a very little, a very small number among the numerous shipwrecks um, uh, under the oceans. And uh, we picked this up because um, this is all shapes on um, half uh, the majority of cargoes are uh, Chinese porcelains and the uh, Chinese ceramics. And um, actually the trading ships have to um, face a lot of risks. For example, um, the, the submerged reefs, uh, the undercurrents, uh, storms, and they have to fight barrages from uh, pirates and, uh, and the enemy country ships and they have to pull into shore for, for, for replenishments. Um, and they also have to, according to the seasonal winds and ocean currents to sail. So it was only after great endeavors and danger that the vessels could finally reach their destinations and retail the goods for a remarkable profits. However, um, if less fortunate shapes showing us here will be wrecked and uh, uh, staying um, at the bottom of the oceans, um, like remaining there over centuries after they were, uh, before they were um, being discovered and salvaged in the modern time. So um, they were called as a time capsule because they can review the primary porcelain types traded to different overseas markets at different periods of history. They are a very good reference for uh, research to identify the um, 
the dates of both links and uh, the different groups uh, of both link types to different destinations. And in our excavation, uh, we have selected uh, six uh, shipwrecks to show their uh, Chinese ceramics cargoes to the visitors to let them get in a like whole idea uh, how about how uh, was this kind of ceramics cargoes look like and the differences uh, make from time to uh, time. And this one, the San, Isi the San Isidro sh uh, shipwreck is a very early example, which is sank off the coast in the Philippines. Um, and uh, as shown here, uh, the primary uh, ceramic cargo of this ship is uh, from Zhangzhou. They are mainly the Zhangzhou West, which is have a lower quality and uh, um, make the Southeast Asia for their main target markets. And the rack two of the Royal Captain Shaw, um, this one have an, a combination of the Zhangzhou West and the Jingdezhen West, uh, which showing showing the uh, like the 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 cause and the fine porcelain have been uh, uh, like uh, transported and traded together to some different destinations or the um, different customers. Yeah, here are some, uh, some pieces from it. And also the famous Wan Li shipwreck. Um, and uh, here I would also to uh, ex explain a little bit uh, to our audience that uh, maybe you notice that um, the, there's all broken pieces of the Chinese ceramics from shipwrecks, but this is not always the thing. Uh, it depends on how the ship was wrapped. Uh, like um, for the Wanli shipwreck, it, the, the, the ship was exploded before it sank down to the bottom of the uh, oceans. So like over 80% of the Chinese porcelain cargoes were broken into pieces before the ship is um, go, going down to the waters. So um, this is why um, the cargoes are all in pieces and uh, broken shirts uh, like this. Um, but uh, like for some later examples, like the Kamau shipwreck, which is near the coast of Vietnam, actually uh, most of the cargoes were preserved complete while maybe it is sank slowly down to the water because the broken of the ship. And here also showing the difference um, of cargoes from the earlier shipwrecks. Like here we can see the saucers is um, more uh, probably used for the tea, tea drinking. And um, we can see it's much smaller in size and uh, it always have a thinner body. And also um, the decoration is more exquisite. Um, in the Yongzheng period. And also the Zelda Malson uh, shipwreck, which were being called Nanking Cargo before the scholars have identified it as the uh, trading ship of Dutch East India Company. And uh, this ship is also um, like loaded with a lot of uh, tea wares uh, from China, like shown here and the famous uh, cup and saucer with pine decorations. Uh, we can see here the thin, very thin body and uh, uh, the cup and saucer are very light. And also the Patavia ware, which is famous for its brown uh, glaze outside and uh, blue and white inside. Um, this kind of um, um, wares uh, are called Patavia ware because uh, Patavia, which is today's Jakarta, is um, the headquarter of the Dutch India Company at the time um, for the Southeast Asia trades. So um, the orders of Chinese porcelain are all sent from Patavia. And uh, among them, uh, there are some kind of uh, orders uh, of this kind of uh, porcelain wares. So this kind of wares were really popular among the Dutch family. Uh, for example, this painting is showing how the Dutch family use this kind of Patavia ware uh, at their tea party. 
And uh, we can notice also a very interesting point that um, actually a lot of uh, European um, people are using the saucer uh, to drink tea. They sometimes put the tea inside the saucer uh, and they think it's easier to be cooled down and mm -hmm. just <laughs> use this saucer to drink the tea. This is very interesting. And you may notice this in various paintings during the time uh, if they are like uh, showing a tea drinking um, and also um, the Jisaru and the Tatsin shipwreck, which have a lot of Zhaowes um, in with their cargoes. Actually, the Zhaowes is nev ne never the mainstream of the Chinese trade porcelain or ceramics at the time, um, but um, they are still um, cherished by the uh, overseas customers. And we will see later also uh, the use of the showers uh, in Europe. There's some examples from the shipwrecks and we can see there's many clues of the sea creatures because they were sucked in the oceans for uh, so many years. Yeah, and after all the ships, like not all the ships, the, all the luckiest ships have arrived their destinations then we are uh, moving into the section five. Uh, in this section, we will see how the Chinese ceramics were used in the daily life of um, overseas markets and the development of uh, Shinwari, which to, very, uh, to varying degree altered the way of life and uh, authentic taste of the rest of the world. Uh, on the other hand, the expanding overseas markets also led to a varied uh, authentic and functional requirements for the Chinese export porcelains. So their types, quality, and decorative styles manifested um, unprecedented um, uh, diversity. So here shows how, here, here I will show some examples uh, to you. Uh, and before starting the European market, actually, um, we will go through uh, shortly about the traditional markets in Asia. In Asia, uh, first, um, maybe you already recognize this porcelain, which is traded mainly to the Japanese markets. They are showing a strong taste of Japan, like a Japanese taste. Mm, and with this is uh, an enameled pieces and also the maple leaf shaped dish. And this kind of uh, dish uh, are of very small size and they were uh, imitating the shapes of uh, plants, animals. Sometimes um, they um, up, uh, daily used objects and they were mainly used for the, the, the kaisiki lioli, which is still popular uh, today in Japan. So this is uh, for the Jap Japanese markets. And also um, you can see um, the Chinese porcelain designed for the Islamic world and showing here. And I mean, the majority of them were being uh, recognized uh, as they have the Arabic uh, inscription and uh, some, uh, some have the Arabic cubit, some very uh, spe specific motifs. And uh, one example like shown here, uh, they are showing the inscriptions sometimes from the Quran and also um, west to the Thai and India and the Middle East. This is uh, showing a taste um, of the royal family of the Thai. This is their orders to make this kind of uh, Jindajin wares. And this is um, mainly found also in Southeast Asia and uh, Turkey and the rest of and the rest part of the Middle East. And um, like in a gallery, actually, when we turn left, we will see uh, a very impressive showcase as shown here. Um, it presents a set of dinner service um, made in Jinzhouzhen, and uh, it's what it was um, made in blue and white. Uh, and this is actually, this is not a um, complete set. Uh, as I know, a complete set may be over 120 pieces, but this one is of 80 pieces only. 
and we can notice maybe there's only one tea pot and without uh, tea cups and saucers, so still uh, not a very complete uh, one, but still uh, make everyone impressive by its quantity and uh, beautiful decoration design. Uh, and also this one is a very popular um, pattern, the Velo pattern, which is designed by the Western um, designers, but being sent later back to the Jindozhen, let the um, potters to like represent this kind of, uh, they called the China, the specific China view. Actually, it was according to the imagination by the Europeans. It's very uh, interesting. And uh, um, also, uh, there's some uh, like new um, types of Chinese porcelain, especially for the European market, like this um, punch bowl, which, which is used as the container of, for punch. And the punch is also um, being introduced to Europe in, the, like, uh, in a relatively uh, late time. Um, uh, yeah, the early 17th century and from India by the, inst uh, by the British sailors. And uh, so this is uh, a quite exotic drink during the time. And uh, uh, at the same time, they are using an exotic container for this. So this is really, a pop this became really popular uh, in upper classes to show their like uh, wealth and uh, status. This is also um, two set of cup and saucers with pine designs, as mentioned earlier, being seen uh, in large quality in large quantity in the shipwrecks. And uh, here showing a picture, uh, showing a painting on um, that's how they were making the uh, they were make and they were prepare and drink the tea um, like uh, in 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 UK in England at that time. Um, and uh, we see the details here. They are using this kind of very thin body and blue, uh, blue and white uh, cup and saucers for tea drinking. And actually different from the, the drinking habit in China, which we just uh, um, prepare the tea leaves and drink the tea after it was um, ready. Uh, actually, the English, English people, they just add a lot of... Uh, different things like showing here the sugars, uh, salts and some other spices. They add milk, they eat, uh, they, they drink tea with um, the bread, mm, cookies, cakes, like everything can be added to the tea drinking. So this is also um, generated the culture of afternoon tea, which has later became popular again, also um, in Hong Kong here. And also here showing an example of the using of showers, which is, which is really rare in the European market. And um, this is also a painting showing a set of uh, um, tea surfaces. Uh, we can see here an example uh, from our own collection, but this is also not a complete one. Um, we can see here, um, besides the teapot and uh, cup and saucers, they have plate for bread, uh, a big bowl for um, put the uh, used uh, cup and saucers, used uh, tea leaves and a cold tea, and also bowl for sugar. And this is the milk jug, and uh, uh, this is the jar for uh, for hold uh, tea leaves and uh, to prepare for the tea. And also coffee. Uh, actually, it was during the 16th to 17th century that uh, the cocoa beans, coffee beans, and tea leaves were introduced to Europe one after another. So at that time, they were all new and high class uh, like beverage for the Europeans. Um, and uh, for example, the hot chocolate, the coffee, and tea are actually full of exotic style and uh, um, also like uh, showing the wealth of the uh, mid middle and upper classes. So that's why they are using this, um, this fine made acquisite Chinese porcelain to hold this kind of uh, beverages. 
Um, so this is a coffee pot, which have been a prototype from the metalworks used commonly in Europe. And this one is also have their origin from the Middle East, like shown here in an earlier painting, uh, like um, preserved in the collection of the Top Kavi Sarah Museum, showing that um, this man is brewing uh, coffee with the coffee pot uh, of a similar uh, ship. So, um, and uh, also like uh, the coffee drinking actually um, has is a old tradition for the Arabians, uh, which are popular ones um, in the Middle East. Um, and actually the Chinese porcelain West was already used at a uh, an earlier time as the coffee drink services, uh, like the picture, uh, like the painting showing here. Uh, this is showing the officials uh, in an imperial festival of the Ottoman uh, Empire. And uh, the coffee sellers is uh, just uh, serving them with the blue and uh, the Chinese blue and white bowl um, contains coffee. So this is um, why we believe that the Chinese porcelain is already used uh, for coffee at an earlier time before it were arrived and applied to the European coffee drinking. Mm. And also this uh, shell ship stand is have a specific function, which is um, have their, uh, have its prototype from the Spain silver uh, named uh, Maserina, uh, Ma Manserina, uh, which is used especially for holding the cup of hot chocolate, as the painting showing here. So we can imagine how uh, it was so elegant uh, for them to drink a cup of hot chocolate, coffee, and tea. So this is also a very important um, like social, uh, social media mm -hmm. for them to show off their wealth. And also, uh, at the same time, the European customer sending orders of the specific types and functional requirements, uh, their favorite uh, decoration, um, decorative motifs, such as the, um, the, the, the themes from the um, biblical um, stories, um, Western myth, and some uh, or coat of arms of the families uh, became popular and uh, commonly decorated in the Chinese trade porcelain. And uh, there's a lot of examples in our exhibition, um, but maybe um, to be short, I just uh, show some, some pieces here. And, oh, the time is already, <laughs> it seems I already over time, so I will keep it short. And here shows, here shows a pair of saucers showing the um, story from the uh, Greek myth myth uh, mythology. And to be short, uh, maybe many of you already know the story. Actually, uh, for the Chinese borders or painters, they have no idea about what the story is telling about. So actually as a main character, uh, the Jupiter's lover, um, Samuel, is, who is being pierced by the Cupid's, uh, Cupid's arrow, uh, down, laying down here under the tree was disappeared in the saucer here, which shows that the potters have no idea what the story is telling about. So just mm -hmm. missing out the important character. And also we see that the expression of the space, light and shadow are um, very different. Um, and uh, take example for the coat of arms, that the coat of arms actually used um, in the middle aged uh, battlefield to uh, for the soldiers to identify a friend or foe um, by like recognizing their um, own specific specific patterns which decorated in their armies and later this became the um, the owner of a family even for the royal family and uh, the arist aristocrats so um, being uh, still using today and uh, the coat of arms, um, there's here showing some coat of arms of the uh, Chinese street porcelains from our own collection. We can see, for example, um, they are not always used a whole design of the uh, 
uh, coat of arms like this one. It just uh, draw the crest uh, as part and uh, use also the initials of William Woods who ordered this postling uh, as a whole as a design for the coat of arms. And also um, in some times uh, like following the union of different families or the marriage between two families, um, the coat of arms could be recognized and uh, to, could be reorganized, uh, reorganized, sorry, and combined to um, to the birth of an, a new one. And so we move to the final part, and the final part should be very uh, very short actually, um, because uh, actually in this part I would like to tell the story about um, how the Chinese ceramics was uh, impact the world industry of ceramics, but due to the limitation of our own collection, we have like uh, no pieces of overseas uh, made uh, like ceramics pieces to as an, uh, like a, as a comparable reference. So uh, in this um, part, um, visitors will see only the, uh, the, the Chinese um, ceramics, mainly the Jing uh, made in China, and then exported to the Europe to have a second decoration. And I believe this is also the early stage uh, that the, how the European workshops and factories try to do research on the Jing Dojin West and uh, to transform them um, in terms of decoration to be a more, um, na a more native style to a more native style. Um, and actually in Europe, um, artists, uh, scientists, and porters just uh, persisted in their exploration of secrets behind the Chinese porcelain. And many local ceramic factories were developed or established to copy the China ware during the time. And um, among all these factories and workshops, um, here's one which is also been active in decorating the Chinese porcelains in the early um, time, which is the Meissen factory uh, marked with his um, the crossed swords at this bottom. Um, still use, the, the mark is still used today by the Meissen porcelain factory at Germany. And uh, uh, the Meissen, Meissen porcelain factory was the first who have successfully produced a hard paste porcelain at the beginning of the 18th century like showing here. So after that, the ceramic factories across Europe um, reached the peak of imitating Chinese products and manufactured diverse ceramics on a considerable scale that copying um, the, the products of China, for example, the Yixing Wares, the underglazed blue wares, and the Dehua wares. So um, uh, during this time, um, the European porcelain factories uh, looked to China for essential reference on raw materials, uh, familiar and uh, uh, porcelain production procedures, as well as, as division and the cooperation over labor and patterns of operation in factories. So the Chinese ceramics had exerted critical and far-reaching influence on the rise of the porcelain industry in Europe. As shown here in the map, actually the early famous, even the royal um, porcelain factories in Europe, they are all copying the Chinese wares uh, as an important start to uh, service their customers. And uh, yes, and this is um, like, we are moving to the end of the talk. And um, although um, the China's trade porcelain industry faded out of the historical stage with the rise of the world uh, porcelain industry, and maybe uh, the story I'm telling here will be forgotten someday. Uh, actually, uh, I always would like to share this sentence and to my audience that, uh, which is written uh, at the westernmost post of mainland Europe in Portugal, in the, uh, in the Cape Roca, it says, where the land finishes, the sea starts. And this sentence actually encouraged many Portuguese sailors to 
um, put their lives at risk to explore the ocean world. And um, for me, it sounds like uh, uh, the history is keep moving on. Um, even like someday the Chinese trade porcelain, the history of the, the golden age of the Chinese trade porcelain will be um, totally, forgot, totally forgotten, but the, uh, like the cultural heritage of the ceramics will passed down and being injected with new blood and new stories through generations. So there will be no real end of a story or history. So this is my talk. Thank you. And I will take the last slide to um, express my thanks uh, on behalf of our museum to the benefactors, uh, institutions, and the persons who have supported this exhibition. Uh, and uh, thank you all. <laughs> Well, thank you, uh, Dr. Wang. This is truly amazing. <laughs> um, that the uh, uh, the way you map out, I mean, the scope of um, the Chinese ceramics, uh, global circulation, and all these, uh, you know, um, different aspect of the uh, impact. I mean, so comprehensive um, in both the breadth and the depth. And utilizing the um the, the most updated scholarship and also the um the the object, I I, I learned a great deal. <laughs> the, um, Thank you. Yeah, there are some questions, and uh, uh, I I'm personally I have a lot of questions, but uh, there's one I posted at the very beginning. Um, the um it's concerned about me too. I mean, uh, after your talk, I mean the uh the show sounds so great, but we know it's already um. Ended. So the first question is Julian Q. I uh, had some two questions. One is when will the galleries be open again? And will oh. the show the show will be uh, um, kind of um, preserved or partially preserved as a you know permanent show? Because I, I found that we're during the pandemic and the Hong Kong situation, right? So I think many of us wish to to see it. So so any plan from the uh, the museum? Uh, yeah, actually, uh, our galleries will be open to the public again uh, next. Uh, let me see, I think uh, maybe Wednesday. Mm -hmm. It's uh, it's uh, April twenty uh, first. Okay. So due to okay. the yeah new pandemic uh, regulations, uh, all the public museum will, will open on that day, and uh -huh. uh, so do our exhibition. Uh, okay. Because of the pandemic, actually the schedule of our uh, exhibitions have changed several times mm -hmm. and uh, yeah now um, the the exhibition enchanting expectations will um, go on <laughs> will continue until this august so only, um, only this august uh, yeah <laughs> because we still have a great doubt that it will be able to travel you know uh, yeah. of course you know there's a, a, a quarantine issue and uh, and also um the, the visa issue. So um, only yeah. to the August, there's no plan to go beyond. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, year. it's also a little bit pity for us because um, because the customs is still uh, like, you know, uh, mm -hmm. like very uh, strict um, regulations. So uh, visitors mm -hmm. cannot, the overseas visitors and also the mainland visitors cannot visit us. I know, this yeah. Time. So it's yeah. such a shame. Uh, uh. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, uh, we hope there's a, a, any other form to uh, like uh, reopen this uh, exhibition to our visitors in future because our new win is under construction. So after the new win is opened in 2024, we mm -hmm. will have more space. Maybe mm -hmm. um, we will present some permanent exhibitions. Mm -hmm. Maybe we will include the export uh, ceramics as a part of our permanent exhibition of the Chinese ceramics. Mm -hmm. Hope so. Okay. So there will be some selection of the exhibits. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you. Mm -hmm. I certainly mm -hmm. hope that I will get a chance to see it. And the same <laughs> question, uh, I, I will encourage the audience, uh, please, uh, you know, um, type in your question uh, through the Q&A, okay? Uh, I still have a couple of them to go through, but um, while we're going through this couple of questions, um, if you have any, you know, um, inquiry or want to have some uh, dialogue with Dr. Wang, you know, uh, please, um, you know, um, type into the Q&A, okay? 
Um, also from Jillian Q, and actually I have the same question. The um, I found it just really fascinating. I mean, the um, the uh, the early uh, phase. Uh, that's uh, something I'm actually most curious, and and especially when you mentioned the um, um, the shot from the uh, discoverer in the uh, the the Guangdong in, in that island. <laughs> it's kind mm -hmm. of like nailed it down, right? The, uh, you now have the archaeological uh, artifacts. So anyway, this co this question is about what's uh, the uh, this uh, soft paste. Uh, ceramic. And I think it's coming because I also mark it when you mentioned the Medici uh, copy, right? And they obviously there's, um, you know, quite a number of them uh, see your extent. So uh, you call this uh, in your uh, caption called soft paste ceramics. So, uh, and, and originally in my note, I mark it, you know, so this soft paste is ceramic, you call ceramic, you didn't call it a, a poster. So I was wondering, you know, what is this soft paste? Because it reminds me of the Delft whale. And the, uh, so where was this produced? And or what, well, how do you define the soft paste ceramic? This is a question from the, the, mm -hmm. um, the Jillian. But then I also have other questions. So can you uh, answer this one first? Yeah. Okay, no problem. Um, regarding the soft paste, uh, actually there's another word called hard paste. Uh, the soft paste and hard paste is um, like occurred to divide the real porcelain and the porcelain of lower, the, the ceramics of lower temperature, like uh, before the Meissen porcelain factory has produced the real porcelain, which reaches the, uh, the, the temperature as 1,350. Uh, it is uh, a real like porcelain. Um, mm -hmm. Actually, the Europeans uh, are uh, already produced uh, ceramics mm -hmm. in a lower temperature. Uh, mm -hmm. So this is being called the soft paste because yeah. the body is not added with kaolin, which mm -hmm. is uh, like uh, necessary to mm -hmm. uh, reduce uh, to 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 produce a very hard spot, uh, hard body as the Chinese porcelains do. Mm -hmm. So. The soft paste is just a lack of raw materials, and it was being uh, fired uh, in a like a relatively lower temperature. Mm -hmm. So it was not really meet the standard of the uh, the the real um, porcelain. So that's mm -hmm. why they called this the soft paste. Okay. So I have further question because you dated this uh, fifteen around fifteen seventy five to eighty, and so I'm curious. I th I thought the Delft well. Um, um, did not appear so early, right? So where, where were this possibly uh, um, produced? This, uh, um, the Medici's uh, soap paste or ceramics. Do uh, we know sorry. the production center? Oh, the production center is uh, Florence. Oh, it's in Italy. Yeah, it's, oh. yeah, it's Italy. So Italy oh. is also like starting their ceramics producing a very early time. Oh, and wow. Okay. Yeah, for many uh, like specific style. And also actually when the Chinese porcelain have been uh, uh, imported in Europe, they have learned uh, the, not learned, maybe uh, like have absorbed the decorations and some uh, specific shapes mm -hmm. from the Italian ceramics also. Mm -hmm. Okay, so is it a uh, uh, pre-date uh, Delft whale or about the same time? Sorry, excuse me. Is it pre-date uh, Delft whale in uh, in 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 uh, uh, by the Dutch or about the same time? Because it's uh, produced in Italy, and I only uh, know the, the 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 Dutch started, you know, they are similar with this, uh, you know. Um, what do you call um, the uh, the so, white paste, but also not exactly uh, porcelain yet. Mm, mm. So what what's your relationship in terms of the date with the, the uh, It seems that they are all trying to figure out. And so the Italian uh, surface of the Dutch. Uh, yeah, in terms of ceramics, it seems, but I, I'm not the expert of this kind of uh, this uh -huh. aspect. Yeah. Uh, like. Uh, to my knowledge, I think maybe um, the Italian uh, make the ceramics earlier than the Dutch. And, oh, really? Uh, okay. Yeah, and uh, uh, and also um, in my uh, in my uh, knowledge, I think um, the Delft, the, the Dutch is famous for its the Delft, uh, the Royal mm -hmm. uh, Factory. Yeah. And the Delft is the first to imitating the Chinese 
both lanes. Mm -hmm. So even um, even when they are not in a, 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 the equal uh, quality, actually mm -hmm. they are try to uh, reproduce the uh, different um, decorations and the Chinese mm -hmm. styles, and also in terms of shapes. Mm -hmm. So yeah, maybe it's more maybe more popular later in in the Delft factory. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Well, this mm -hmm. is totally new to me. That sounds very yeah. interesting. But, but, but you know, kind of, um, it's, um, if you think about it, it's a, it's a logical mm -hmm. kind of phenomenon because we mostly know yeah. the trade with the Dutch. So um, I only learned about uh, Delft whale. I didn't know that Italian. <laughs> yeah. There's another call, uh, uh, question from Paul Yu. Um, that the porcelain production before the you know the European uh, developed the uh, the porcelain uh, technology, China used to be the uh, mo mo uh, the monopoly on porcelain production for over a thousand years. <laughs> Is it feasible <laughs> for China to apply a Guinness uh, world record on this? I, I, I thought this goes without saying, right? China is the, China is China, right? The kingdom of China. <laughs> yeah. Do you have any comment? Uh, yeah, I think, uh, yeah, it's uh, China is already uh, get very famous like for the Chinese porcelains uh, and uh, the, the techniques, the techniques and the traditions. I think people, yeah. In anyone who like get involved or who are interested in ceramics will know this uh, more or less this kind of history. So I I, I have no like uh, worries about <laughs> okay. yeah <laughs> but, but this is a quite a good uh, like uh, uh, advice. <laughs> Well, before I receive any further question, I think our time is almost, uh, you know, um, <laughs> we exceeded two, two minutes, but uh, if I don't receive any further question, I'm, I'm going to mm -hmm. ask, uh, you know, one more question. <laughs> the, <laughs> I thought your last part, the uh, this international um, uh, fashions, I mean, this is something I think about interest a lot of people. I, and I'm amazed that, that you were able to uh, kind of pin it down, you know, <laughs> oh, this uh, 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 cater for specific, uh, you know, taste and in, uh, in a region from Japan, Islamic world, Thai, India, and, and um, Turkey or South Asia. I mean, this uh, is there a more and more research, or this is something um, I, I I'm I'm really uh, 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 impressed by it, able to do it, you know, and the uh, and also this whole set of production. So is this uh, something very difficult or we have more and more uh, uh, information? Yeah, actually, like before, uh, especially for the Chinese scholars here, it's very difficult to tell, uh, like uh, the, the, the only thing we can identify is uh, this is for the overseas markets and the other is just for the domestic market. Uh, but based uh, on, especially actually, it's the discovery of the shipwrecks Mm -hmm. with different cargoes because mm -hmm. we know um, many of uh, like most of the time the some record about the shipwreck so we know its destination mm -hmm. uh, its period so when we check about their uh, cargoes we will figure out um, mm -hmm. which kind of uh, like group of types or decorations were more um, popular for some uh, specific destinations Mm -hmm. And also with the archaeological discoveries mm -hmm. on the land sites from different uh, mm -hmm. countries and the districts, mm -hmm. for example, the like the royal palaces in Japan or mm -hmm. some like handed down uh, pieces, we will figure out at uh, this time maybe the overglazed enameled pieces were more cherished by the Japanese and mm -hmm. also the Middle East. Mm -hmm. um, like due to the collection of the um, uh, Topkapi Sari Museum and mm -hmm. the shrimp, uh, the, shrimp um, mm -hmm. the art bill shrimp, mm -hmm. like for example. So um, there's some uh, like uh, um, uh, examples from a public or private collections. And mm -hmm. also uh, I think maybe we will rely on the archeological part, mm -hmm. part because that is really uh, consolidates the, mm -hmm. the, the uh, uh, and evidence Okay. So by like um, going through this kind of materials and we will like reconstruct 
on the different markets and how it was the Chinese porcelain were used mm -hmm. uh, there. So this is how we like gradually figure it out and there's still a lot of work to do mm -hmm. to see like a different periods and the different mm -hmm. destinations and how they transform uh, the, the, the production or design of Chinese mm -hmm. porcelain. Yeah. Well, I think you're really entering into a new phase. So I want to join, you know, many other audience to so thank you again. And the, also lastly, other than archaeological material, I truly enjoy all the paintings that you were able to pull out, you know, and to illustrate and make it very, very convincing, truly, you know, convincing. And I enjoyed it. And thank you again. Hope I can continue consult you in the future. Yeah, no problem. <laughs> so, yeah. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> All right, thank and you. thank you, our audience. So um, I think we'll, uh, you know, uh, complete today's uh, event here. Right. Thank everyone, thank have you. a thank good you. weekend. Yeah. 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 yeah, happy weekend, happy Easter happy. Uh, Sunday. Yeah. <laughs>